Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. This is Dr. Dave Hansen and you're watching the Perfect Storm online recorded workshop where we dive into uh, the causes that are behind neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism, ADHD, uh, sensory issues, all that good stuff. So uh, buckle up, we're going to be going over a lot of information so and tune in and uh, it's going to be good. So to get us started, I want just to introduce myself to you if, you if you're not familiar. I'm Dr. Dave Hansen. I'm a pediatric and family chiropractor here in Batavia, Illinois. Uh, that's my lovely wife, Kristen, up in the upper left-hand corner there. Uh, she was a fourth grade teacher for nine years, and she just retired several years back to help me run the office here. So she's been uh, very passionate about helping kids since the get-go. And uh, that's our focus here in the office as well, so that's something that we share. That little guy in the lower left-hand corner is my son, Jack. He is the man. He is what uh, Chris and I are doing uh, and who we're spending time with uh, when we're not uh, in the office doing this stuff. But the reason why I have this workshop recorded on here is the actual Latin root word for doctor means teacher. So that's something we take very seriously. Obviously, my wife came from education, and myself as a doctor take this educational piece very seriously. Uh, so we do workshops on any number of different topics. So if there's something else that you're interested in learning about, uh, reach out to us. Chances are we've done a workshop on it and can send it over to you. But our practice is a little bit different in that uh, we focus on uh, pediatrics, family wellness, and pregnancy. Which is not typical when you what most people think of when it comes to chiropractic. They think headaches, neck pain, back pain, and we certainly help people with those things. But it's um, it's not really our main focus. We we like seeing a lot of kids. Over half of our patients here are kids, uh, and the other half are usually usually the parents of those kids. Um, but if you look at the bottom of the screen here, this is what we tend to help people more with, the more visceral health issues, more so than just quote unquote pain. Uh, and the reason for that is actually a pretty good story. I'll be brief here, but uh, the reason why I see kids, because it's a heck of a lot uh, more difficult to introduce people to pediatric chiropractic and explain why we do this as opposed to just uh, getting the low-hanging fruit of neck pain, back pain, headaches, but it all started in uh, a remote island in the heart of Nicaragua. Uh, these are two volcanic active volcanoes surrounded by shark-infested waters, and there is a tiny little island or a tiny little town right in the middle of them that I went to for 10 days when I was actually still a chiropractic student. And we were there uh, working with some friends of mine that we all went together to work in this clinic that was the only source of health care that the people on this island had. Very impoverished community, uh, dirt floors, no electricity, hardly any running water, just the whole nine yards. And this little free clinic uh, that was run by volunteers is really the only kind of health care that these people had access to on a regular basis. So when I was there... Uh, one of my first days there, uh, one of my friends came to get me because someone had brought in a baby, and they knew I had some experience in training there. So I went to go see uh, this child, and I was expecting that it was going to be like colic or constipation or something, you know, quote unquote, easy. But what I found was when I went into this back room, it was this mom just bawling her eyes out, holding this limp, twitching baby, uh, who was, I mean wasn't even crying, just whimpering, wasn't strong enough to cry. His diaphragm was spasming with every breath. This was obviously something very wrong with this guy. And I didn't speak Spanish, she didn't speak English, so through a rough translation, I came to learn that it was a, a rough birth and that ever since he wasn't latching, he wasn't nursing. Uh, which, in a place like Nicaragua, if you're not nursing, then it, it pretty, means, pretty much means you're not eating because it's not like there's a Walgreens in every corner where you can go get formula. So this poor little guy, was, he was essentially he was starving to death. It was failure to thrive. So I took him, and I wanted to get a baseline on him. So um, I checked for reflexes. He had none. There were no reflexes present. That's that's bad. Uh, things are, are really not working well if all of your reflexes are absent. So I knew uh, from my experience as a chiropractor that the most vulnerable part of a baby during the birth process is the top part of the neck. And it's also the most important from a neurological standpoint. And since I knew he had a rough birth, that's the logical place to start. So I checked his neck and his atlas vertebra, which is very top one, it's right at the base of your skull, uh, it was kicked way off to the side. It was way out of alignment. So I gave him a very gentle but very specific adjustment to that top vertebra. And like that, he started crying. And I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> what happened here? Uh, so when I checked his reflexes again, and they were coming back. They were, they were weak, but they were they were there when they weren't before. So I was like, holy cow, and I gave him back to mom. I was like, nurse him, nurse him. And so she did, and he latched, and he got a meal, his first meal in I don't know how long. And so it was the most incredible thing I had ever seen, chiropractic or otherwise. Uh, literally saw life flow, flow back into this kid, um, which was incredible. But it was also very sobering because 
you know, this mom left her other kids with a neighbor. She was a single mom and took a three-hour bus ride to come see me at this clinic to get this one adjustment. But, you know, the reality was this kid didn't need one adjustment. You know, he needed a lifetime of care, and he, frankly, he wasn't going to get it. And the sad truth was he might not make it, this guy. And so that's when this pediatric chiropractic thing stopped being, you know, quote-unquote specialty or niche, but it became the mission. Because here in Batavia, Illinois, we may not have a lot of kids dying of failure to thrive because we have great access to urgent care here, but we do have an epidemic of kids suffering from autism, ADHD, sensory issues, seizures, headaches, migraines, constipation, ear infections, all these terrible things that they, they don't need to suffer from. And so that's what we do what we do here. Uh, but to make this story an awesome one, um, this is a picture of that little guy a year later. Uh, one of my friends went back to volunteer at the same clinic uh, the next year, and I told everybody about this story. So she actually recognized this guy based on my on my story, and uh, she grabbed a picture for me. And apparently, uh, he went home and he kept nursing. That adjustment was enough to get him get him over the hump where he could uh, keep feeding and doing what he needed to do and grow and develop into this beautiful little baby here. So now his picture actually sits uh, in my office above um, the couch where parents sit when they're coming in to find out if I can help the kid. So I'm looking at this guy uh, when I'm talking to his parents as a constant reminder of the power of chiropractic and what it can do for these little guys. So anyway, that's why I see kids because once you have an experience like that, you don't forget it. All right, but let's get into what we're going to get into tonight. Um, I want to kick things off with this fun little awareness test. It's a, it's a fun little video. Just follow the instructions and we'll see how you do. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? So, did anyone see it? <laughs> so far, every time I've used this uh, video in workshops, uh, no one has seen the moonwalking bear. But that's kind of the theme for what we're going to go over today. Nothing that I'm going to be talking to you about is some big, unseen, silver bullet kind of a thing. This is its not unknown stuff, but its going we're going to shine a light on things in a way that you haven't seen before. And we're going to connect the dots in a way that is going to make sense but also in a way that, again, just ha has not been done before. Um, so th buckle up. We're going to be going over a lot of big stuff, but it's going to be really good, and it's going to make a lot of sense. All right, so th you know, to set the stage on what our kids are dealing with, um, I have I put together a short little video just kind of explaining what, what the status quo is today, unfortunately. The government says autism is showing up in children more than before. One in 50 school children has a form of autism. Asthma rates rising dramatically over the past decade. More than one in seven children in the U.S. receiving a diagnosis of ADHD. Numbers from the CDC have steadily increased in the past decade. In the last 30 years, obesity rates for kids have tripled. Frightening to parents to hear those dramatic numbers. It may reduce the life expectancy of this generation of children and diminish their quality of life. Our kids are sick. They're screaming out. They want help. He still didn't have a single word. He was drooling. He was rubbing his head against the carpet. He was pushing himself into walls. His eyes swelled shut. He was covered with hives from head to foot. Probably around 14, 15 months, all that language disappeared. <laughs> from all that I can see, it looks like we've got a child here with pervasive developmental delay. Noah, Noah. You keep holding your stomach. Does your side hurt? <laughs> Having a child with autism, it's not. It's now human vision. Unfortunately, today, too many of our children, by analogy, function as canaries in the coal mine. They are teaching us that something is deeply out of order, 
deeply imbalanced, deeply in need of understanding, and largely lacking in therapy. I think the first step to transforming this problem is to, to understand it. Oh, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Most of the pediatricians I went to see basically told me there was no chance for recovery. Your son was just born with this, and uh, it would be best for you and your husband to just accept your new normal. I knew Ben was going to get better the day I got the diagnosis. He's not going to get better. No, I'm not really hearing that. When you tell a person that there's no hope, that their child will always be this way, that there's nothing you can do about it, that's not science. That's a misuse of statistics. The doctor said, um, no, your boy will have autism for a very long time, but my mother didn't give up. She kept on thinking of ways to try and get rid of autism. There's an abundance of intriguing individual cases, or what we call anecdotes. They cry out to be better studied and documented. So to think that just a few short years ago, he had to be in a room with an air purifier plugged in to his nebulizer, you know, flash forward to now, and he loves to hike and he loves to be outside. He couldn't do that a couple years ago. People say kids can't recover. Well, they do recover. I've seen it. I've seen kids recover from autism, from ADHD, from Tourette's. I've seen it. I feel like his true personality is coming through again. He has so many friends. He's got more best friends than I can count. <laughs> when he's doing BMX at the track and I'm sitting there watching him, come on, go, go! I just know that there's no limits to what he can do. We've been trained to believe that these illnesses are genetic and inborn and we need some kind of scientific miracle. That's not what we need right now. We need a fundamental rethinking on the optimization of our health and the minimization of threats to our health. <laughs> as we blaze this trail, others can learn as we have that it is possible to look at the individual, to remove obstacles to recovery, to evoke healing responses, and to do that in a way that is both very personal and rigorously scientific. We're losing a generation of children. That's what's at stake. If we project the current trends forward just half a century, everyone will be in a hospital bed taking care of the person next to them. We cannot continue on the current trajectory, and yet it shows no signs of abating. Clearly there's just, there's something going on and there's something wrong when I can walk into a room of 20 kids and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's at least one EpiPen in that room. The economic cost is astronomical to our society and, and the societal costs alone are, are tremendous. Something is hurting our children and pretty soon it's going to be one and two and then what? Then are we going to look at the issue? The time is now for the scientific community to take recovery environment and nutrition seriously. Our future depends on it. We need to start talking about our children's health. I picked him up and I put him in the car and I was like, hey, did you have a great day at school? He's like, oh, I had a great day at school. And I was like, I am so proud of you, Connor. And from the back seat, I hear, oh, I'm so proud of you too, mom. I'm like, no, I'm proud of you. No, I'm proud of you. I won. I won and I'm here. The reason why I'm doing this is I'm here to other to tell their parents like you can win too. So I cry like every single time I see the thing. It's ridiculous, but uh, it just does this beautiful job of, of of showing just how what a profound effect this has not only on the kids but their entire families. And and my frustration as a healthcare practitioner who serves this population and has for years that they do get better. I see it all the time. Yet parents come in here all the time uh, with with almost no hope left because they keep getting told over and over and over again that there's nothing they can do. So so frustrating. So uh, so I, I hope you hope that connects with you as, as much as it does with me. But it was a couple of years ago uh, that they were, Ebola was all over the news and they were just making this big to-do about every time you turn on the TV, they're talking about Ebola, how it's going to wipe us all out. And I mean, what, like, like two people got it, two Americans got it. And like, not to downplay that, that's certainly a tragedy, but like, there are so much bigger issues out there. I mean, asthma affects a tenth of our kids and that's not just like a minor thing. 
that's very scary watching your child struggle to breathe. Then uh, ADHD kids is up to one in seven. The most common drug prescribed for these kids is a class two controlled substance, the same as cocaine. Side effects including sudden death. I mean, how many parents have been told that their child might die just from taking this medication? It, it's ridiculous. I was just looking in, into this as of uh, Tuesday of this week, December 2nd, 2015. In the past 50 years of them using, uh, prescribing this drug, they have never once done a study uh, that's comparing the pros and cons. Never once in five decades of prescribing this drug to kids. That's ridiculous and unacceptable. But a fifth of our kids have some form of mental illness, and the latest figures from the CDC are showing one in 45 kids have a diagnosis of autism. Um, that is almost double than the numbers from four years ago. Now, when people talk about why the sudden increase, a lot of people will say that, well, it's improved diagnosis. And sure, I'm, that is obviously playing a role because it's getting more attention now, but that's not going to nearly double the numbers, numbers in four years. And the other thing that people are pointing to is genetics. This is just a genetic thing. Kids are born with it. Nothing you can do about it. Genes don't change as fast. Genes change over centuries, not over a few years. And what's more important, what does change quicker, is the environment. And more importantly, how our body responds to the environment. So that's what we're going to be going over tonight. So I, and I'll call this workshop The Perfect Storm. That is not a reference to the old George Clooney and Marky Mark Wahlberg movie from uh, 2000 or whatever it was. Uh, what it is is a reference to the onslaught of stress that our kids are facing nowadays. They're facing more stress than you and I ever did when we were kids and at a much earlier age than you and I ever did. And there are three different types of stress that kids face. We call them the three T's, toxins, which is chemical stress, trauma, which is physical stress, and thoughts, which is emotional stress. So we're going to break these down one at a time. And as we do this, start taking a little mental check boxes as you think about your son or daughter and the conditions and the issues that they're having. So let's start with physical stress. A uh, big one here is birth trauma. This is the common thread that we see in almost every kid that calls our office uh, or who parent calls our office about their child that has ADHD, sensory issues, autism, anything in that arena. Almost always there's uh, some sort of birth trauma in there, uh, specifically C-sections. So this is a very big one. But in utero constraint also plays a role, especially if there's like twins involved uh, and spills and falls. Kids are always getting knocked around. Um, the well-intentioned back to sleep program has resulted in these kids just living on their backs and they get a flat spot on the back of their head called plagiocephaly, which is kind of a big deal. Your brainstem is right there and uh, we're going to touch on that here in a bit, but that's, uh, that's a factor. And then with as busy as parents are nowadays, kids are spending more and more time in the car seats. Baby Bjorn's, uh, you know, baby wearing is a wonderful thing, but if it's not a well-supported, um, Item, it can put stress in the kid's spine, which causes all kinds of neurological issues. And then bumbo seats are just awful. They just they just re, uh, recalled uh, hundreds of thousands of them up in Canada. Everyone should just throw them away. Don't don't even donate them. They're, they're just really, really bad for babies because it forces a, a baby into a sitting position that their spines just literally are not ready for. And uh, it can cause all kinds of problems down the road. But I want to spend more time on the birth process here or the the undiagnosed birth trauma specifically with c-sections only because i see so much of it in our office uh most moms even if they've had a c-section uh don't really know what happened there you know they, they were obviously they're going through quite a bit on their own sometimes they're completely unconscious dads oftentimes aren't allowed in the room so i'm going to show you a clip of what a c-section looks like you know fair warning to the squeamish but this is going to convey what happened there much more than any words i could say so so watch this Here's of a girl. Here's of a girl. Make you cute for the camera. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Just coming back. Good. There you go. All right. Uh, so that's that's hard to watch. As many times as I've seen that. I mean, does anyone think that's okay? You know, uh, you know, and I'm kind of picking on C-sections here. You know, thank God we have them when they're needed to get mom out of baby safely, but. That needs to be addressed. That was a tremendous amount of pressure that's put on that kid's head and neck with twisting. As their first event um, in life is to get pulled out of mom like that is, is quite a thing. 
Um, like my son is a year and a half years old. If I were to pick him up by his head to, to show him off to people like, Hey, look at my son, Jack, they'd call the police on me because that's going to hurt him. And I mean, this is the same thing that happens with these kids, but somehow it gets a pass, but they estimate it's anywhere between 60 to 90 pounds of traction that's put on a kid's head and neck during a C-section. That is a tremendous thing. And that needs to be addressed because your brain stem is right up there. There's a lot of really, impor really important neurology up at the top part of your neck that gets put under a lot of stress during that. The World Health Organization will tell you that there's no re medical reason why our C-section rate should be any higher than 5 to 10%, but just down the road here in Batavia at Delnor Hospital, it's 40%. That's one of the highest in the States. So this is, uh, this is a big deal. And that has a lot to do with the uh, all the interventions that happen throughout the pregnancy and the labor that uh, oftentimes uh, starts the domino effect that leads to the C-section, even if it was not planned. So chemical stress. This could be its own workshop in and of itself. This is a very toxic world we live in that's getting only more toxic. And that goes anywhere from our foods, um, you know, pick up a box of anything in the grocery store and see if you can even pronounce all the ingredients. Uh, this is a big deal. We just did a workshop on sugar a couple weeks ago in our office. The recording is on our website if you want to take a look at it. Uh, but sugar is a, a big deal. It should really be classified as a toxin. And they cram that stuff in everything. And, you know, they do that not only because it is, you know, a preservative and makes food taste better, but it's literally addictive. Like, it has the same effect on your brain as cocaine. That's not an exaggeration. And it's, it's a legal addictive substance. So, of course, they're going to put it in everything. And uh, it's, we're feeding this stuff to our kids, and it's very bad for us, and is a big factor for everybody. Then there's environmental chemicals everywhere in our air, and our water, and our food, but also stuff in our house, household cleaners, detergents, etc. Uh, we're on the brink of winter here right now as I record this, so we're going to be spending a lot of time indoors. Uh, the air inside our homes is actually much more uh, toxic and polluted than the air outside, and that's just because of uh, degassing from our furniture, our carpets, and uh, chemical sprays, and, and everything else that we, that we do. We don't get the fresh air that we so need to detox our bodies. But this is an extra big deal for babies because they don't have the, I mean, the livers aren't fully developed. They just don't have the detox systems ready to go that you and I do as adults. So any toxic load that they're exposed to has that much more profound of an effect. And I, I want to touch on vaccines here too. Not that I want to open that big whole can of worms, but regardless of which side of the fence that you're on in terms of pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine, there's no arguing that that's, that's a big stress to introduce to a baby. Uh, when I was growing up, I believe we got 10 vaccines, and kids nowadays are getting like 40. That is a huge increase. That I mean, that's got to do something. I mean, when was the last time that you encountered measles, mumps, and rubella all in the same day, and that these kids get injected right into their bloodstream? So that needs to be understood and addressed and talked about because it is a factor. Now, they did a study. This is pretty uh, interesting. Uh, this was in 2003, I believe, that they did this. But they researched from all over the country, took uh, blood samples from the umbilical cord of babies right after they were born. And they were looking for 400 specific chemicals. And of those 400, they found 287 of them, 180 of which are known carcinogens, 217 are toxic to the brain and nervous system, and 207 of them causes birth defects. And they were confident that if they had expanded their search to different chemicals, they would have found more. So this is a, incredible. 287 chemicals found in the umbilical cord blood of an infant. There's um, this belief or myth out there that there is a placental barrier, that, that babies in utero just don't get exposed to the kind of things that, that moms do, that they're protected. And unfortunately, that's just not the case. They're exposed to the same stuff that mom is, which includes medications. And uh, this has an effect because, again, this is the most vulnerable part of their life to these things, and they're beginning exposed to a tremendous amount of it. But food is also huge. Uh, if you have a child that's suffering from autism, ADHD, uh, or sensory issues, you probably know that their diet is a big factor. It's, it can be very difficult to manage it with these kids. But it's so important because their food literally becomes who we are. There's a lot of really good resources out there. Um, my personal favorite is Food Matters. You can check this out on Netflix, iTunes. It's, it's all over the web. It's really easy to find. There's a quick clip from it I wanted to show you all. 
One of the best things terrorists could do is just build more fast food restaurants, maybe add another pharmaceutical company, have a couple more infomercials, and encourage people to eat the way they eat now. And everybody's going to be dead in a hundred years. They can just walk right in, don't have to do a thing. One quarter of what you eat keeps you alive, and three quarters of what you eat keeps your doctor alive. Cancer rates going up, heart disease going up, stroke going up. We're poisoning ourselves with highly processed, nutrient depleted foods. One of the major problems is what we do to the soil and the air and the water and everything we take in our food. We, for whatever reason, decided we're going to spray everything with every kind of pesticide, herbicide, larvicide, fungicide. We decided we're going to genetically modify things we don't know anything about. Can we actually improve what has already been created? And the answer is maybe, but not the way we've been doing it. If you want to know what's wrong, look down at the table. It's staring back at you. Think of it as chronic malnutrition, because that's what's going on. But if we think we're going to go to the doctor and get a pill for everything, we've missed the whole point. We have been taught our whole lives to be consumers of modern medicine, which is pharmaceutical medicine. Good health makes a lot of sense, but it doesn't make a lot of dollars. Now, the drug industry has every right to make money, no question about that at all. The ethics, I think, need to be very closely watched. What the pharmaceutical companies are doing may not necessarily be in the interest of our population. You can be as sincere, and you can be sincerely wrong. Approximately 106,000 Americans die from pharmaceutical drugs each year. And these are people who took the medication as directed. There is a lot more turning to alternatives because what's being done before you doesn't work. There is no magic bullet, but there is a lifestyle change that reverses serious chronic disease. It's cheap, it's simple, it's safe, it's effective. The solutions are here. They've always been here. Every single person in the world, every culture, every language, every person in the world knows it. You are what you eat. Food does matter. It's a choice. You don't have to be sick. Love that movie. It's it's so powerful, and I, I watch it from time to time myself just to re-energize and recharge myself when I need to uh, make some changes to my own diet. So I encourage you guys to check it out. All right, but then emotional stress. This is another big one, and this actually starts right from the beginning of the pregnancy um, because mom and baby share a nervous system. So if mom is stressed, then baby's stressed. And pregnancies nowadays, I mean, gosh, it's right from uh, fear right from the beginning. I mean, it, the whole process about what's what can go wrong. I don't know if you guys have ever read What to Expect When You're Expecting, but I swear that was written by Stephen King. Uh, they have one now for babies and toddlers and kids and teenagers, like a whole series. If you want to be terrified for the entire life of your kid, you can check those out. But, I mean, it really starts in, in the beginning with all the testing and everything else that, that they uh, that they do. Uh, it's all about, all about what can go wrong, which it just it puts mom in the wrong mental place for this sort of thing. And then when you get to the actual labor, you know, they put her on the back, which is just the worst worst position to be in. It's a very sterile, medical, cold environment, which is not, you know, the, the warm, happy, calm place that mom should be at mentally, uh, which, you know, tr it has a tendency to, to uh, encourage emergency deliveries like C-sections. Then when the kid is pulled out of mom... Uh, during a C-section, they're often put in a NICU. So instead of laying on mom's chest, feeling that her her uh, familiar heartbeat, they're by themselves, hooked up to these machines in this in the sterile environment, which is just not a a calming place for a child. And then uh, you know, mom and dads are more and more busy nowadays, and um, so the, these kids feel the same stress that we do, and they end up getting labeled with ADHD or whatever, and they realize it, and they feel weird about it, and that can be a stressor too. And then, of course, there's bullying that kids are dealing with more than ever before. So there's a lot more going on uh, with emotional stress than I think most people appreciate with kids. So that is definitely a factor as well. So, you know, there's a big misconception that common means normal, um, but this is the stuff that is quote-unquote normal nowadays because it's so common. But I would, what, what I would tell you is that none of these things are normal. They're just they're just happening way too frequently now. And as a result, 
we're seeing way too much of this. I mean, how many time, how many kids do you know that don't have something going on? Some kind of label, some kind of EpiPen, some kind of allergy, some kind of special classes they need to go to. It's not like it was back in my day in the 80s when I grew up, and, and really no one had any of this stuff. Something has dramatically changed, and that's what we're going to, going to shine a line on today. So this is when we're going to get a little bit nerdy. Uh, you know, I, as uh, I'm a nerdy chiropractor, I get my certainty, my confidence, and my excitement for this from the science. I like being able to tell you why A leads to B leads to C. And so, and you know, I have a tendency to overdo it a bit, so I apologize if I get a little too technical here. But in my experience, uh, parents with these kids suffering with these issues are just information junkies. I already have their PhD from Google, so hopefully you'll, you'll follow me along here. Don't get too hung up on the technical terms. We have this whole presentation in written format we can send you. Uh, so don't worry about like taking notes. Think more about your child and their specific issues. Keep that top of mind so as we go through this, you can see if this is resonating and sounding familiar to you. So we, are, we already went through the cause, the three T's, the physical, chemical, and mental stress. They cause a condition that known as subluxation. This is a neurological condition, sub meaning less than, lux meaning light, and asian meaning condition. So a condition where there's less light being expressed. It's basically the nerdy sciencey way of saying a kid is just not expressing life and their potential up to where they, they could be. And the effect of that is what we call the four Ds. So the three Ts call the, cause the four Ds. And we're going to break these down one at a time right now. So the first one is dyskinesia. Dys meaning dysfunctional, kinesia meaning movement. So when you think of your spine and you get like a kink in your neck, it's a, like a stuck spot. Like if you were to bend a hinge on a door, it's not going to swing through its range of motion properly. Same kind of thing happens in your spine. If something gets misaligned, you've just lost some range of motion. So think back to the, again to the birth process, that C-section video in particular is pretty obvious where that can get started. But this is a big deal. They actually did, uh, a medical doctor did some research, Dr. Gutman, and he looked at over a thousand infants right after they're born, and he found that 80% of them had one of these quote-unquote kinks in their neck that was significant enough to cause interference to, the, to their nervous system and their immune function. And because he found it in so many babies, and most of it didn't have obvious signs and symptoms, his conclusion was that all babies should be checked by a chiropractor and adjusted if necessary. And this was nice to hear from coming from uh, a medical colleague. Uh, but this was done back in the 80s. I would wager if he were to repeat this research now uh, with the d changes made to the birth process since then that this number would be closer to 90-95% of babies. And, you know, if this research actually just came out last year, what they find is that you are nearly 40 times as likely to end up with a diagnosis of autism if you had a cerebellar injury at birth. Your cerebellum is right at the base of your skull, right at the top part of your neck. Again, the most vulnerable part during the birth process, especially during those C-sections. You have an injury there, often undiagnosed, you are 36 times as likely to end up with a diagnosis of autism. This is a big, hairy deal. Uh, you know, and sure, the vaccines, they, they're what getting most of the press now when you talk about autism and its causal rates. It, it is a factor. It is a blip on the radar on this study, but it is nothing compared to this birth injury. Uh, this is where we should be focusing our time and attention uh, because there's so much more we can do about it. So dyskinesia, you have this poor movement in your spine. Who cares? Why is this a factor? Well, it's because it causes something called disafferentation. Dys meaning dysfunctional, afferentation meaning the input up into your nervous system. Because your spine isn't just muscles, bones, and ligaments. It's, it's the communication highway between your brain and the rest of your body. And we perceive our world through our senses. And everyone knows your five senses, the sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell. But there's actually seven senses we have. The other two that people don't talk about is balance and movement. Movement is what we're going to talk about right now because this is absolutely vital for the health of your growing and developing brain. Movement, the, the technical term for it is mechanoreception, and we have these receptors in every joint in our body. Uh, and so this is how, like, if you close your eyes and have someone, like, reposition your arms and legs, you know exactly where you are in time and space. It's these movement uh, nerves that are telling you that. And there are two types of this movement sense that you that you can get stimulated. There's what's called proprioception, with the good, which is the good, healthy brain food. And then its opposite, opposite number is called nociception, which is like noxious stimuli, not necessary pain, but just like noise, stressful input up into the nervous system. And these two exist in a state of balance. Uh, proprioception actually blocks nociception. So this is a, a very big part of what our brain is dealing with on a daily basis. 
we have proprioceptive input coming from every joint in our body, but 60% of it comes from just our spine, a third from our neck alone. So again, I keep coming back to the top part of your neck as being just an absolutely crucial part of your body in terms of the health of your nervous system. And because this proprioception is such a big part of who we are, if we have disc decreased movement there, we have decreased proprioception, which means by default, we have an increase of nociception. So that's what we see so much in these kids is that they have a decrease in this good, healthy brain food and an increase of this noxious stimuli, constantly feeding up in the nervous system, making this a dysfunctional kind of input up into the nervous system. And there's this great video. This is actually made by occupational therapists about sensory processing disorder, but it's a really good il illustration of what I'm talking about here. Some kids are really bouncy and can't sit still. Some kids aren't very coordinated. Some see food as a pile of toxic goo that hurts their mouth and jangles their taste buds. School might be a mysterious place where things don't make much sense. If this sounds like you, you may have sensory processing disorder, and we're going to explain it here. Your body has seven senses, vision in your eyes, hearing in your ears, touch in your skin, taste in your mouth, and smell in your nose. And you have two movement senses, your muscles and your sense of balance. In sensory processing disorder, these senses don't communicate right with your brain. Think of the nerves connecting your brain and senses as a set of roads. Those roads should be smooth superhighways so that the senses and brain can communicate fast. If you have sensory processing disorder, then some of your roads are bumpy and rough. You can also think of the senses as having a broken volume control. If the volume is too high, you will feel your senses too strongly. If the volume is too low, you won't feel sensation at all. In fact, you'll want more. Some kids overcome these problems as they grow older. Others need help. Help is usually occupational therapy, and it's fun. Occupational therapy helps build up the connections between your senses and your brain. The more you do, the stronger and smoother they get, kind of like paving those roads. After a while, you'll learn to slow down and sit still, to pay attention, to eat, to be comfortable and happy doing movement. It takes time. There's homework, too. The more you work at it, the better it gets. So I think that's just a really good, good illustration of uh, how OT, uh, occupational therapy and chiropractic, work so well together. Uh, I love OTs. Uh, I like to think that they do the same thing as chiropractors do from the outside in. We work from the inside out. So you put us together, you get this really great synergistic effect. In the video there, they talked about smoothing out these rough roads. Uh, in the same analogy, what chiropractic does is it removes the roadblocks. And then the OTs groove those good patterns. So these kids, they just get better so much quicker. It's a really great, uh, really great combination. All right, so you have this disafferentation, this dysfunctional input up into your nervous system. This causes a condition known as dysautonomia. Dys meaning dysfunctional, autonomia referring to your autonomic nervous system. This is the part of your nervous system that controls everything that happens automatically. It's basically everything but your muscles. So every organ, gland, uh, all your major systems, your immune system, digestive system, hormonal system, all that stuff is controlled by your autonomic nervous system. And so if you have all this negative input into your uh, autonomic nervous system, it creates some dysfunction. What I mean by that is this. Your autonomic nervous system has two different modes of operation. You've got what I call gas pedal mode, which is your fight or flight stress response. This is about survival. This kicks on if you're in danger, playing sports, you're scared, something like that. It's supposed to turn on when needed and then turn right back off again. The flip side of that, the brake pedal side, this is where growth and development happens. This is immune system, digestive system, sleep, all that good stuff happens over there. But I like this visual because this is how it works. It's, it's like a teeter-totter. If one is turned on, then the other is turned off. This quote by Dr. Bruce Lipton says it perfectly. You can't be in growth and protection at the same time. 
And so many of the kids that we see in our office are just stuck on the gas and they just can't slow down and they, they're missing out on these growth and developmental phases because their bodies are just not in that place where they can get there. And so the question comes, well, why are their brakes not turning on? Well, as it turns out, there is a single nerve that controls this entire braking system. It's called vagus, uh, V-A-G-U-S, which is Latin for the wanderer. It's the longest nerve in your body. starts on your brain stem, again, top part of your neck, uh, passes down either side of your spine, hits your heart, hits your lungs, goes through your diaphragm, does all of your digestion. Uh, it's huge in terms of what it does. But the main thing that it controls is this whole parasympathetic braking system. And it lies within a millimeter of your atlas vertebra. It's the top vertebra in your spine. What we're looking at here is a, a top-down, uh, or actually bottom-up view of their vertebra. So in that black space is actually where your um, spinal cord is, and all the white around it is your skull. So if that's misaligned, like say during a C-section, things get rotated, and it impinges on vagus nerve, and it can't do its job, and you just lost your brakes. This is what I end up talking about with almost all of my patients because it's just such a big deal and it affects so many. It began because of this birth process. It, it just is manifests itself in many different ways, but it's because these kids just can't slow down to do what their body needs to do and heal. All right, so you, you know you have this kid that's stuck on the on the gas so in the total sympathetic overload. You end up with a condition known as dysponesis. This is defined as a reversible, important word, physiological state consisting of unnoticed, misdirected neurophysical reactions to environmental events, bodily sensations, emotions, and thoughts. I think the easier way of saying it is errors in energy output and mental organization. I mean, doesn't that just sound like these kids that are stuck on uh, with ADHD and autism and everything else, that they have errors in their energy output and men mental organization? Um, think of it as the whole good in, good out thing. This is, you know, good in, good out, garbage in, garbage out. These kids are getting a lot of garbage in into their nervous system, a lot of stressful input, so they're going to get stressful output. And what's really cool about it is the technology exists now where we can measure it. We can track it. You don't have to look at a kid's subjective symptoms to try to figure out what's going on with them. We can do a scan. It's totally safe, painless, non-invasive, same stuff they use on astronauts to let us know exactly what's going on with these kids. And, you know, I'm not big on labels. You know, the ICD-10 has thousands of different diagnosis codes for these kids. I really just look at three different categories because uh, these just what makes sense to me. Uh, the first is the raging bull kid. These are the kids that are just full gas pedal to the floor at all the times, total fight or flight mode. These often have a diagnosis of ADHD, anxiety, uh, just those sorts of just bouncing off the walls type behaviors. This is what a scan on this kind of kid would look like. Don't look at uh, the visual on the left so much. I'm not going to get into that. It's really uh, helpful and powerful, but more specifically what we're looking at for our purposes today are these numbers on the right. These numbers on the right are basically put in uh, an objective specific number or score in terms of what we're seeing on the left there. So specifically on this one, I want you to look at the total energy. All three of these numbers in a perfect situation will be 100. This kid's total energy is four times normal. How you interpret total energy is it's like the volume knob. How much stimuli is this child getting into their nervous system? Again, garbage in, garbage out, good in, good out, that same process. This kid is getting a ridiculous amount of stimuli up into his nervous system. It's like there's Metallica blasting it all the time in the background. This would make me fidgety. This would make me stressed out. This would make make it difficult for me to sleep and focus in class and sit still. Um, I mean, th this is what I always try to, to show these moms is moms and dads is that you can probably you know quote unquote train a kid like this to sit still and behave the way you want them to, but it will never feel right to them because this is the way they're perceiving their environment. It's just a very stressed out place. the The way that they see their their world is is through the lens of the survival mode. And this is why we have to get the input into the nervous system back to healthy levels. Second type of kid we see is what I call the drunken bull kid. This is where the nervous system is just really disorganized and disconnected. Maybe it's a normal amount of input, but just it's just firing this just a bizarre pattern. These are the kids that have a lot of sensory issues, a lot of uh, core strength problems, their balance controls, they're clumsy, uh, sometimes they're space cadets. Uh, that's the drunken bull kid. And on them, they might have a normal amount of total energy, but the pattern score is super low. And this kid, he got a 45 out of 100. So again, just the input that he's getting into his nervous system is just really confusing. And he's having a really hard time processing it 
uh, and so they they can look spacey. And the problem is, is the the drunken bull and the raging bull kid outwardly they can look very similar. An ADHD ADHD kid and a sensory processing kid look very similar symptom wise, but what's happening to them is completely different neurologically. And so being able to do an objective test like this where we can really see not only what the child is experiencing, but what they're dealing with, it's so much easier to know how to process this and, and, and handle them. Because the way you, you work with an ADHD kid is completely different than the way you work with a sensory processing kid. So the amount of information we get from these scans is just wonderful. But there's also the drunken raging bull kid. This is the combo kid. Not only are they getting a lot of information in the nervous system, it's really disorganized and confusing. So these are the kids that have the, you know, the really nasty stuff, the autism, uh, the epilepsy, seizures, things like that. This is what their skin might look like. Really low pattern score, really high total energy. They're just being inundated with a lot of confusing information. These kids need a lot of help. So, you know, I'm a chiropractor. Why am I talking to you about all this? Well, it's what we do really has nothing to do with sore backs. You know, chiropractic has been around for over a century, and it's never been about sore backs. We're nervous system doctors. And the reason why that's so important, especially for these kids, is I'm coming back to Bruce Lipton. Uh, again, the PhD in biology. He's, he speaks chiropractic clearly, and he doesn't even know it. But uh, this is a quote from him that says, The function of the nervous system is to perceive the environment and coordinate the behavior of all other cells. Doesn't that just sound like these kids? They're having problems perceiving their environment and coordinating their behavior. Uh, you need a nervous system doctor, and this is what chiropractors do. We're the only ones that do this. So please, please, please get your child checked by a pediatric chiropractor. If you're not in the area um, outside of Chicago, still contact me. I will find you one. I know all the good ones. I've referred uh, parents to doctors as far away as Australia. So please reach out to us. But the reason why this is so important is your spine isn't just structural. It's, it's the middleman between the brain and the rest of your body. This is the way it communicates. It's, it's a living, breathing neurological organ. And its, it's importance can be seen in developing babies. It is the very first thing that forms when in utero. First, you start get the brain and the spinal cord. And based off that, all the little nerves butt out to form all the other organs in the rest of your body. And, it's, and the reason for that is because it's essential for that communication between the master controller, your brain, and the rest of your body. If you have a dis dysfunction there, then you know it puts a ceiling on your potential because if, if your brain can't communicate with an aspect of your body or not communicate clearly, then, then you're in trouble. So this is the way I like to think of it. Brain controls everything. Its job is to send messages out to the rest of your body just telling it what to do. Your brain sends, or your body sends status reports back to your brain, just a constant stream of information happening through your spine. And as long as that is intact, everything in your body, even at a cellular level, is functioning the way it's supposed to. Everybody's doing their job. Then you're in what we call a state of ease, which is just what it sounds like. Things are easy. Your day-to-day -day processes are no big deal. You encounter a stress, you deal with it and move on. Everything's great. And it means, it doesn't mean you're never going to get sick and never going to die, but it does mean you're going to be a healthy person. There's no reason why you shouldn't be. You're not going to be dealing with these chronic health concerns that plague so many people nowadays. And it goes out saying you're going to feel pretty awesome. So what happens if you have subluxation, this thing I've been talking about, this, this kink in your spine? Well, think of that as a disconnect between brain and body. The messages are not getting through the way they're supposed to, so things start to malfunction. Again, this starts insidiously at a cellular level. But if it goes on long enough, you end up in a state of dis-ease. And I do not mean that you're diseased. I just mean that things are no longer easy. And I don't care if you're a person or a car. If you're, if you're under constant stress, it's just a matter of time before something breaks down. And then you do lose your health. And you end up with one of these chronic health issues that none of us want for our kids. And you're going to be feeling bad. So let's take an ADHD kid, for example, uh, just going through this. You, sure, you could give them you know, Ritalin or medications or whatever to help with this bottom part here to help them feel better, but it's not going to do squat for all these other things because what we're looking at up here, this is what's causing it. This stuff down here, that's just the effect. So we have to get to the cause. Otherwise, we're just chasing symptoms. So to bring it all together, our kids today are facing more stress than you and I ever did, and at a much earlier age than we ever did, and they're, they're being literally hardwired for a stress response. Our, our brain is, is always changing and adapting and literally forming synapse connections based on what it's exposed to. So if, if our kids are constantly facing stress, their brain is going to be wired for stress, and that just becomes 
who they are. So we need to rewire them. So what we need to do is remove as much stress from their lives as possible. The parents, that's your job. And then help them process and adapt to the stress. That's my job as the chiropractor. So what would I do if my son, if my uh, little guy Jack, ended up with one of these diagnoses later on in life? Well, I know it sounds biased, but the first thing I would do is i take him to a pediatric chiropractor. And not just any chiropractor, but the one that uses this scanning technology so we can accurately measure uh, what is going on with him and track our improvement. If I wasn't getting it done, I'd bring him to a different chiropractor. Second thing I would do is occupational therapy. I love OTs, especially because, you know, they're doing the same thing we're doing, just from the outside in, and we work from the inside out. If you're in the area here in uh, Batavia, Geneva, St. Charles, my uh, personal favorite is uh, Miss Brooke Baxton and her entire team over there at my recess. Or they're just phenomenal people. They get amazing results. Their facility is unreal. Uh, when you see it, you're going to want to host your kid's birthday party there. It's just a, such a fun space. And uh, they know how to read scans the same way we do. We're, it's, it's, they're just really great to work with, so I would encourage you to check them out. I think work on the diet. I'm sure you, if you have one of these kids, you know that this is going to be a battle. So when they start in my office, I usually don't even go down this road until we start getting some progress with their with their scans and clearing some of the stress out of their system because otherwise this is just a battle not worth fighting right in the beginning. But I always tell parents that you start by adding in good before you start removing bad. Um, most every kid will eat at least something good. Like let's say, for example, it's carrots. The kid will eat carrots. It's the only veggie they'll eat. Then you know what? They're getting carrots in every stinking meal because not only is that getting them extra vitamins and minerals that they would otherwise be missing out on, but it, it physically takes place in their stomach that would otherwise be occupied by junk food. So little baby steps. There's a lot of good resources out there on our website and our Facebook page, so check those out too. A um, lot of good ways you can sneak good food into your kid's diet. And supplements are big too. I, I'm actually not a big supplement guy. I think we should get our nutrition from our food, not from a pill. However, uh, that can be tricky with these kids if not if they're not eating a good diet. So a lot of these kids are nutrient deficient, so it's important to to make up for those lacks. And so you start with a multivitamin. That's the basic catch-all, so your kids aren't deficient in anything. Uh, Fish oil is big, it's well documented in how it helps kids with, with autism, ADHD, and pretty much everything else under the sun because it's so anti-inflammatory, which we would all benefit from. Um, many parents uh, with these kids are familiar with the gut-brain connection and how important the gut is to our overall health. There's actually more nerves in your gut than there are in your brain, so it's a huge, important uh, system. And uh, if you have a cruddy diet, chances are you're, you have really bad uh, gut flora. Your gut bacteria is way out of balance, and a probiotic will help bring that in balance. So it's a really easy way to, to make a dramatic uh, change to your kid's health. Vitamin D is huge because I don't know about where you're watching this from, but here in Illinois, we don't get enough sun, which means we don't get enough vitamin D, which is an essential vitamin. So it's just one of those things we have to take. Same thing with antioxidants, just help our bodies deal with stress. And a number of our moms have reported they've had a lot of success with essential oils. I am no expert by any means. Uh, I have a patient uh, here who is my quote-unquote oil dealer. And so if you need somebody, I'm happy to connect you with her. She is wonderful and has uh, just a wealth of information on essential oils. Um, but with anything, when it comes to supplements, quality counts. Um, there are a ridiculous amount of supplement manufacturers out there, and the supplement industry is not well regulated. And if you're taking a low quality supplement, oftentimes it's worse than not taking anything. So make sure you trust your source. Um, there's way too many out there for me to know everything about all of them. We carry a handful of the core stuff here in our office just because I've vetted it and I feel great about it, and that's what I take myself. But there's other good brands out there too. Uh, you just um, you have to do your own due diligence on checking them out and making sure they're reputable. All right, play. I actually read a study here recently that kids on average today only get three minutes of fun goofing off time nowadays. Three minutes a day. That, that's crazy. Uh, there was another study I just read yesterday that showed that uh, activities like climbing trees have a huge improvement on the kids' uh, school performance and their, their memory. And it's because of proprioception. The article even uh, references that. And that's the same thing the chiropractic does. You'll find, uh, if you go through this, that the chiropractic research and the science behind it is very similar to the exercise science and the research behind it because it's really doing the same kind of thing. That movement sense is so important for overall health, you got to get it by any means necessary. Then unplug. You probably have noticed that these kids are just glued to their electronics. Uh, and just my personal theory on that is that, you know, these electronics run at such a high frequency, high RPMs, just like these kids, that they just naturally gravitate towards it. 
Um, but it can it can drive these kids further down the rabbit hole. So it's really not a great thing for them. And what I uh, coach parents into doing is that you can kill two birds with one stone by using your electronics, whether it's a TV or iPad or whatever, as a reward for some of these other good things. So if you you know you try a new food, a veggie, then you get 20 minutes on the iPad. If you go outside and play for an hour, then you get to watch a TV show, something like that. Whatever works for your family, just use this as a tool. But the most important thing I would do is don't give up. Uh, there's an expression we use here all the time that says nerves that fire together wire together. And I mean that literally. Uh, your brain will literally rewire itself based on the input that it's getting. So the only variable here is time. This stuff works. There's no way it can't work. You just have to give it time to work. So stay the course. Uh, give what you're doing a chance to, to take effect. And I promise you, you'll see the, some dramatic changes in the health of your child. So to close it up, I wanted to just share the story from one of our moms. Uh, she was kind enough to sit down and do an interview. Uh, this is uh, She brought her son in to us for ADHD, and this is what she had to say about it. closely with Dr. Day, and so I was starting to talk to Brooke about how he seemed to be having some ADHD type symptoms in school, so she recommended that I come see Dr. Dave and get his advice. Um, his teacher was saying that he couldn't sit in his chair. He would stand up um, most of the day at his seat, and he would even jump up and down at his desk. So she was afraid she's going to have to keep them in the back of the classroom the whole the whole year because of that, because he would have been too disruptive if he had sat, sat anywhere else. And he also had trouble focusing, um, following directions, and getting his work done. Like if there was um, a worksheet that she wanted the class to get done during class, he would have trouble completing that. Because he was really not doing well. And the teacher was even saying, I think we're going to have to put him on medication. She even said that to me. school had a Christmas play and so they were all on stage and pretty much the whole time he was kind of in the back of the stage spinning around and just not being able to focus on what was happening. He seemed really overwhelmed with having all the kids on stage and having an audience. He just couldn't get it together to do what he needed to do for the play. And so we were really curious how it was going to happen how he was going to be the next year at the Christmas play, and he was like a completely different child, and he had been seeing Dr. Dave. And he was able to stand there, he was able to look out at the audience when it was his time, his time to speak, he was able to speak. When it was like their time to sing, he was singing. Um, no spinning around, I mean, he was able to stand still. Pretty quickly after he started seeing Dr. Dave, um, he could sit in his chair, so he wasn't the kid that had to be in the back of the room the whole year. <laughs> so that was nice. No, no, Dr. Dave's really good with kids. I mean, he's really funny and really down to earth, and nothing seems to really phase him. Like, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure he sees a lot of different types of kids with a lot of different issues, and it doesn't seem like it frazzles him or phases him, and he just accepts it and just works with them how much he can and he's I think his humor is really what got to Joshua because Joshua has a really funny sense of humor too so I think that's how he really built his rapport with him is that he was able to jump around with him and that made him feel really comfortable so well I've, I've actually referred a couple people here um so I'm always very positive about it. I, I just say, you know, if nothing else, just get the scan. I mean, that's always the first step. If nothing else, just get the scan done. It's not painful. It's not invasive. At least then you'll get information. And then you can do what you want with it. But it's just more information about your child. So that could never be a bad thing.
I don't know about you, but I love that video. I, I get goosebumps all the time reflecting back and thinking about these kids and just the different trajectories that their lives are on as a result of getting reconnected. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the, this workshop. I hope it was informative. I'm sure you have questions and want to sit back and digest everything that we went over because I know it was a lot. Uh, please reach out to us um, on our website via email or Facebook or what have you to uh, ask questions, get engaged, and um, see if we can help. Again, if you're not from the area or you know someone not from the area that would benefit, I know tons of great pediatric chiropractors all over the world. So please reach out to us anyway, and we'll connect you with somebody in your area that can help. So anyway, thanks for watching. If you are in the area, I encourage you to reach out to us and join our tribe. Thank you very much.